Hi folks, I'm Deanna Pennington and I'm speaking to you from El Paso, Texas. Today what we're going to be talking about is mental models um, and how they impact our ability to share information across disciplines. This is the third of four videos. In the first two, we talked a little bit about some background on interdisciplinary research and why it's challenging studies of science teams and some of the challenges that they encounter. We talked a little bit about teams as distributed cognitive systems, socio-environmental systems themselves. We have people interacting in an environment and that needs to be treated as a system with different scales of interaction. And we talked about the fact that uh, knowledge integration and shared vision is really an emergent property of that system that takes time to develop. Then in the second part, we talked about vocabulary. We made some distinctions between multi, inter, and transdisciplinary research. We talked about the fact that as you move from multi towards transdisciplinary, uh, hopefully develop more and more integrated linkages across the disciplines. And we tried to do uh, some definitions on this new notion of convergent research. Then I also introduced this language about boundaries um, that's going to be important again today. We talked about boundaries around disciplines that we draw. The disciplines create themselves through time. There are many definitions of mental models floating around. This one makes the most sense to me. It comes from this paper from Jones et al. Uh, a mental model is a person's internal cognitive representation of an external reality that allows them to interact with the world. It's a model you create in your head of the things that you observe in reality. So if you think about that, we know that as you're looking out on a landscape or out on some phenomena, uh, your eyes are absorbing data from all over the place, but you don't mentally process all that data or you, your brain shape creates a model of what you're looking at based on your experience, your prior experience. And so mental models are built on personal experiences through a lifetime and they're based on your knowledge. You have mental models that are directly related to the knowledge you've gained through formal education and through informal experiences and your perceptions of the world. If you take two different scientists and they look out on the same landscape, they're gonna notice different things depending on what discipline they're in and what mental models they have built through time around that knowledge. They are incomplete representations of reality uh, as any model is the simplification of reality and it's subject to change. They are inconsistent models through time. And that's a good thing because um, we want to, our mental models to dynamically adapt through time as we have different experiences and we learn new things these representations that you carry around in your head are, are constantly shifting as you have new experiences and you gain new information. Cognitive scientists believe that your mental models really are the foundation of your reasoning and decision making. As you think about a problem and make a decision, you draw constantly on those mental models that you've developed throughout a lifetime. I'm going to try to explain how that impacts working across disciplines in a pictorial fun way, I hope. Here's our scientist sitting here and he's looking out on the world and he's got, at this point, you know, very deep knowledge in his field. And when you look out on some phenomena, we think because we've had all this formal training and we're experts and we know so much that we've got these really well-organized mental models around our field of expertise. But the reality is that our minds are really pretty messy places. And that's partly because the dynamic nature of these mental models, you've grown them through time and through a lot of experiences. And sometimes there's stuff left floating around that's not really very well connected or there's things that you've kind of shoved off to the side as, as you've turned your attention in other directions. Your mental models are really pretty messy, even when it's deep knowledge that you know very well. So what that means is that when you come to try to explain your perspective on your research or your field or your questions of interest to somebody from, that's outside of your field, 
your mental model looks something like this. Um, you have this like really messy, kind of organized foundational knowledge that is broader and that you draw on. And then you've got this really deep, narrow, usually narrow field of interest that connects with all that messy, broader knowledge. But through time, as uh, disciplines progress, they develop vocabulary and jargon around these, all of these concepts that they draw on constantly to support this deep knowledge. If you try to explain that to someone who doesn't have that jargon and that, those concepts, then it's very difficult to simplify and represent your research. If you're the person that's trying to learn the other person's research, you may have some broad concepts that kind of line up with what's needed. You may not have any of these intermediate concepts uh, and you probably don't have anything even closely related to this, these deep concepts that are needed to understand your research. So if you're the one that's listening, you're in, you can encounter this unfamiliar jargon that doesn't make any sense to you. You may not have any comparable mental models. I want to elaborate on that just a little bit. If you have two people from disciplines that are kind of closely related, like environmental science and uh, geology, you have quite a few foundational concepts that are pretty similar and a lot of common vocabulary. And so it's not that hard to work across those disciplines. But if you are an environmental scientist talking to a so social scientist, you may find that you have very different mental models and that there are very few connections, points of connection, and that the jargon is very different. And uh, you may have a, a difficult time really connecting what they're saying to your own knowledge. The further your disciplines get away from each other, the more difficult it is to work on an interdisciplinary team together. And then you start putting, you're not just two people, from two different disciplines working together on these big, complex, ill-defined projects, the, the wicked problems that uh, many socio-environmental problems are, that uh, you have to put together a really pretty big team with a, a very diverse set of perspectives. It becomes non-linearly more difficult to try to find that path to, that you can share together because there just is not enough common ground to figure out what, what is your shared vision. And everybody across the board who studies teams in whatever context will agree that shared, having a shared vision is one of the most important things to the success of a team. And so getting that shared vision is really important and extremely challenging in many of these interdisciplinary research teams. So there are several things that happen. One thing that often happens I like to talk, think about this as the equivalent of medical failure to thrive. You have this you know, infant, infant team you're trying to put together um, and it's just not thriving and you're not sure why. So there are a few things that I have observed. One is that a couple of people with the, the most similar mental models, they will get together and they'll figure out what they can do together. And so they can generate a shared vision pretty, pretty quickly and they think it's a great vision because it makes sense to both of them, but that leaves all the other perspectives out. And then what happens is that somebody who's from a very different discipline can't connect with that shared vision at all. They have no clue how, what they, how they can contribute, what their research would, would benefit from being involved with that. They just, they don't know, they, they can't make the connection and the two people on the right, the people who generated this vision, don't understand why they're not connecting. And then as that proceeds through time, oftentimes what happens is that those people who cannot connect their research and don't under, can't figure out how to make that work, they, they just disengage. They would do their own thing, they keep doing, they're doing their research, they're doing wonderful research, it's the same research they've always done, they're funded by this project. And so then again, people over engaged in the project are feel like they're betrayed because those people are not engaging and not contributing to the project. So I can't tell you how many times I've 
seen this play out myself and heard other people talk about things like this playing out. The way I have been sort of thinking about this is based on some learning theories that have been developed through some de several decades. In particular, Jack Nisro developed a theory he called transformational learning starting in the 1970s. Um, and he was looking at you know, traumatic life experiences. But he's, he said that oftentimes really those big changes, those transformative changes that we and people go through start with what he called a disorienting dilemma. And that the, the, the dilemma itself was what invoked big time of learning that really caused them to substantially revise their mental models. And those new mental models were more comprehensive and more integrative. More recently, uh, learning scientist Bransford, they identified conceptual collision as the engine that drives highly creative thinking as new orthogonal concepts are acquired and mental models are transformed. So both of these researchers are really saying the same thing. They're saying that transforming your mental models really takes a pretty good shove off of your current stance, but that if you can deal with it, you come out on the other side much more integrative and with a much better understanding of the world around you. So that's, of course, what we would like to have happen in interdisciplinary teams. We want, um, we want to put these teams together and we want our research to be transformed by that experience. And we want the research that's generated to be synergistic and more than just the sum of the parts. So there are several ways that I think that these early encounters in interdisciplinary research teams really are disorienting dilemmas and they do invoke conceptual collision. You get this deluge of new concepts and vocabulary that doesn't fit your existing mental models. It's very disorienting. You have new collaborators that may have very different goals and values and behaviors that are their own individual values and behaviors, but they're also shaped by the discipline that they're in. You may be dealing with unfamiliar data and methods assumptions and epistemologies. Different disciplines think about what, what is valid science in different ways. If you're from one discipline and you see what other a researcher from another discipline is doing, you may not immediately recognize it as valid science, especially in this world with new data and we're having to integrate data and integrate models. There's constant, this constant barrage of new tools uh, that might or might not be useful, but you don't know until you invest some time in trying to learn them. What we really want is to get through that disorienting dilemma by generating a shared problem model, by transforming each of our individual mental models in a way that allows us to connect it to everybody else's so that we end up with this shared problem model that leverages the mental models of everybody on the team in certain ways but it's not identical to anybody's mental model. It's different. It's, it's the combination, a synergistic combination of everybody's individual mental models. And so you want this new shared vision, the shared problem model to be generated by the team, by interactions within the team. And you want it to be done in such a way that nobody will have the exact same model of the problem but their mental models have been shaped and changed by the interaction with others on the team. That's what every interdisciplinary research team really is after. And so the big question is how do we do this? Because we know we need to do this, that doesn't tell us how to do it. We do know some things about how not to do it. The Borrego uh, has done a lot of research on teams, empirical research on teams, and she made the comment that most teams adopt one of two strategies. Either they go with ad hoc dialogue around the table, throw everybody around the table and let's hope something good comes out of it, or they do formal presentations. And we know from both of those ends of the spectrum that they don't work. You don't end up with where you want to be. Zajac is a, is a cognitive scientist, and he wrote this really marvelous paper um, that really talked about cognitive load and how, how all, both ends of this spectrum really put significant cognitive load on the participants. That makes it almost just very challenging to figure out a way forward. 
we've got this on the left, we have no structure at all. And on the right, we have firm structure. We think that the, what we really, the way forward is to do something in the middle. So the general solution we think is a lightly structured participatory process, but one that's focused really, really puts front and center that you're, the goal of that is to learn each other's perspectives. It's not, you don't go into this immediately saying, oh, what's our research we're gonna do together? You have to approach it by saying, okay, how can we put a process into place so that we can really learn something from each other? Then we have this Ember solution. We buy into this general solution of the process, but we add in there that as part of the process, we want to go to incorporate the generation and co-creation of boundary negotiating objects to represent and progressively integrate mental models. Our process is lightly structured, uh, but we really focus on these boundary negotiating objects and helping teams learn how to co-create those. So you may remember this diagram from part one, where I talked about teams as distributed cognitive systems. You have a team process. Notice there's a process in here that includes participation. It includes learning, identifying links across disciplines. Instead of what's the research, just let's try to find some linkages first. And we know we have to evolve the system. We have to evolve that shared vision. Um, and that takes time and it takes people who are willing to be adaptable and flexible. And the outcome of that, we hope, is going to be this emergence of a shared co-creative vision and integrated conceptual frameworks. What I did not highlight in that first part, this process, we think this process is really important and doing the process correctly and, and purposefully is really important. But I did not highlight that first time the role of these boundary negotiating objects are critical for providing a path forward. That is it for this part, we're almost to the end of these videos. Next part, we'll be talking about how this actually gets operationalized by the Embers workshops. Mm -hmm.